The story, if you want to know who was Rodney Brooks, the answer is somebody was, whose timing turned out to be good. I was there at the right place at the right time. I wrote a letter to the Syracuse newspaper uh, uh, defending my aunt had been involved in some activity, and that activity was being accused in the newspaper of being a communist activity, and it wasn't. She was just crusading. She was an activist, and I wrote a letter, and they picked it up and that a long series of events that got me to be a witness before Joseph McCarthy himself. I uh, wound up uh, losing my security clearance at the time, losing my draft deferment, getting drafted, spending two years in the Army. But during that two years in the Army, the uh, National Science Foundation came out with a fellowship program, which I applied for and got and received the fellowship. With that and my credentials, I then applied to Harvard University Graduate School, was accepted, uh, wound up at Harvard University in 1956. Uh, just, again, just, the timing is unbelievable. Just the right time to hear my hero, my idol, Julian Schwinger, a uh, professor at Harvard, begin his three-year cycle of lectures. If it had been a year later, I would have missed it. He uh, learned uh, theoretical physics, quantum field theory in graduate school, but I actually went into medical physics. I had a wonderful career at the National Institutes of Health. Before I retired, well before I retired, I became fascinated by the question of consciousness. It occurred to me, I mean, that's, I, see, I was in the um, neurological part of the NIH, the Neurological Institute, and we dealt with brains, and I was doing all these brain scanners and so on. So you think about what goes on in the brain. I call consciousness the biggest gap of all, the granddaddy of all mysteries. I say I would trade a hundred explanations for these other gaps for just to know what consciousness is. This week on the show, we have my uncle, Rodney Brooks, who is a physicist and spent his entire career working at the National Institutes of Health. We talked about all kinds of scientific jargon, so put on your thinking cap for this episode. I know I had to think deeply, and uh, we talk about all kinds of things, including his appearance at the 1954 McCarthy hearings. We talk about consciousness from a scientific perspective and what he calls the granddaddy of all mysteries. And we talk about his book, uh, Fields of Color, The Theory That Escaped Einstein. So if you ever wanted to know anything about quantum physics, this episode is for you. Now, if you like it, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, American Real TV. I'd like to thank our partners and sponsors, especially Alatura Naturals, as well as Happy Socks, turning an everyday essential into a colorful design item. I'll be wearing Happy Socks each and every episode. And now, without further ado, I bring to you Rodney A. Brooks. Welcome to American Real. My very special guest today is Dr. Rodney Brooks, author, and so glad to have you here today. I'm glad to be here, thank you. So uh, tell me, I know um, you have uh, dedicated your career to physics. Uh, you have a stellar career, and we're gonna talk more about that today. But before we get into that, tell us, who is Rodney Brooks? 
That would be me. Yes. Tell yes. us about you. Want to know about me? I do. Well, I didn't, uh, you know, in college I considered different careers and uh, physics, I even considered being a musician at one point, but I didn't have any musical talent, so <laughs> that killed that. And I did go into physics, yes, and uh, my career was in physics. Uh, I wouldn't exactly call it stellar. I had a good career. Uh, I uh, learned uh, theoretical physics, quantum field theory in graduate school, but I actually went into medical physics. I had a wonderful career at the National Institutes of Health for 25 years. I worked with medical imaging stuff. I had some nice successes there. We built a PET scanner, the first high-resolution PET scanner. Which means? A PET scanner is uh, one of these uh, recent imaging breakthroughs. You haven't heard of a PET scanner. It's a, a scanning device where they take pictures of the brain. Like a CAT scan. Well, it's sort of like that. There's CAT scanners, there's MRIs, there's PET scanners. Each of the three is different, and they came along in succession. I was there at the right place at the right time. The story, if you want to know who is Rodney Brooks, the answer is somebody was, whose timing turned out to be good. I was there at the right place at the right time. I started at NIH in 1974 when CT, computed tomography or CAT scanning, had just broken through. I, my first job, my first task was to write a review article to describe this new technique of CAT scanning, and it kind of made my name, so to speak. Uh, and then along came the PET scanning. We built a PET scanner. Uh, I had developed a technique with CAT scanning called dual energy CT that I learned recently has been picked up and is now used in current day CT scanners. And then MRI came along and I, you know, I was just a very lucky guy. So great timing. You've had good timing your whole life. Not because I planned it that way, but sure. it sure worked out that way. Sure, sure. So take us back to 1954. I've heard uh, bits and pieces of this story. 54? Uh, 1954, I believe, is when there was something called the McCarthy hearings. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, uh, some of the people today don't even remember Joseph McCarthy. He was quite a challenge uh, to uh, our system. Uh, he was a communist hunter and he was locking up communists, really locking up people who wouldn't give names. I could tell you a lot of stories about him. He traveled around. Uh, he was finally vanquished by this, this Irish lawyer, Joseph Welch, who said, Senator McCarthy, have you long, at long last, no sense of decency left? Wow. And he faded away. But who was he? Was, who, who did he work for? Oh, he was a senator, and he had a committee, and he took it on himself to uh, expose communists and suppose uh, uh, people he thought were communists, including my aunt, by the way, who was not a communist. She, that's how I got into this problem that you're asking about. <clears throat> I wrote a letter to the Syracuse newspaper uh, uh, defending my aunt had been involved in some activity, and that activity was being accused in the newspaper of being a communist activity, and it wasn't. She was just crusading. She was an activist. And I wrote a letter, and they uh, picked it up, and that was by a long series of events that got me to be a witness before Joseph McCarthy himself. So was this in front of... Uh in, in Congress, or where, where was it? No, no, it was in Lynn, Mass in Boston, Massachusetts at okay. the time. And they held he some traveled hearings. around, you know, that we saw his job. He said to me, don't you think this committee is doing a good thing for the country by going around and finding the communists? And I had to answer truthfully. I couldn't say yes. I said, no, I don't think so. I think you really should be doing what the Constitution says you should do and be in Washington making laws. So I was labeled an uncooperative witness, and this is one of those series of events, sort of like getting to NIH, uh, a series of events that uh, happened to lead me in the right direction. I uh, wound up uh, losing my security clearance at the time, losing my draft deferment, getting drafted, spending two years in the Army. But during that two years in the Army, the uh, National Science Foundation came out with a fellowship program, which I applied for and got and received the fellowship. With that and my 
credentials I then applied to Harvard University Graduate School, was accepted, uh, wound up at Harvard University in 1956. Uh, at just, again, just, the timing is unbelievable, just the right time to hear my hero, my idol, Julian Schwinger, a professor at Harvard, begin his three-year cycle of lectures. If it had been a year later, I would have missed it. He began his three-year cycle in quantum field theory, which I appreciated very much at the time. I went on to do the NIH thing, but then when I f retired from NIH, I, well, that, well, that's another story that we'll get to. Okay, great. And um, uh, before we get there, uh, af after school, after Harvard, um, what did you set out to do for your career? Did you well, have anything in specific in mind before you started at NIH? Well, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I really, if I, if it not for financial concerns, I would have gone on to be a professor, uh, applied to you know, universities and become a professor, maybe even done theoretical physics. Uh, I had a financial need and I didn't think I could afford that, so I took a job in aerospace, um, a company in the Boston area. I then moved out to Milwaukee and took a job with another aerospace company called Delco, Delco Electronics. Delco. Delco, uh, their aerospace division. I worked there for a couple of years and then another one of these breaks where something bad turned into something good. Uh, I was laid off. They lost a big contract, I lost my job, and there wasn't much of an opportunity in Milwaukee for theoretical physicists or any kind of a physicist. And I, uh, the government came to my rescue again. The National Science Foundation was offering another fellowship program to get physicists into medical research. Isn't that funny? For first, in the 50s, they wanted to get people into aerospace right. research. And then uh, that uh, they came along in the what was it, the 60s, and wanted to get people into medical research. So again, I applied for it, I got it. I had two years in Milwaukee <clears throat> in a graduate program there, and NIH needed a physicist. I applied, I was accepted, and I went on to have, it couldn't have been better. So you spent most of your career at, at, at the National years. Institute of Health. 25 years. Okay, excellent, fantastic. So. Um, we're going to get into your book uh, in, in a moment, but um, I, I, I'm curious about one thing uh, beforehand, and that is, what do you, what to you what is what does consciousness mean? Oh, well, that's what led into my book. Uh, I remember um, before I retired, well before I retired, I became fascinated by the question of consciousness. It occurred to me. I mean, that's uh, see, I was in the. Um, neurological part of the NIH, the Neurological Institute, and we dealt with brains, and I was doing all these brain scanners and so on, so you think about what goes on in the brain. And some people think the brain is nothing but a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, and I remember discussions with people, scientists at NIH about this. It became obvious to me that the brain is not just a computer. Come on. Uh, brain does things everything from visualizing a color. A computer could analyze color into the tenth decimal place, but it can't visualize the color red or the color blue. This is something that happens in the brain. You can't explain it. But for me, it was pain. Uh, I remember thinking to myself, a computer can never feel pain. You know, if you touch something hot, it hurts like hell. Come on, a computer could be programmed to say, ouch, it hurts, but you know that there's nothing go on, going on in the computer that is like uh, pain. So I uh, thought about that a lot, and I uh, was going to write a, a book about consciousness. And uh, I was going to have a chapter in there of the different explanations for consciousness that don't hold water, that don't re really explain it. And one of them was quantum mechanics. And uh, I began to read, as I looked into it, began to read about quantum mechanics, I realized that people don't understand quantum mechanics. I did because I had taken these courses from Julian Schwinger about quantum field theory, okay. which resolves all of these problems. 
So, but you were asking me about consciousness. So consciousness to me is something quite remarkable, quite unexplainable. In my book where I write a chapter called The Gaps, I call consciousness the biggest gap of all, the granddaddy of all mysteries. I say I would trade a hundred explanations for these other gaps for just to know what consciousness is. So you're telling me you don't really, we, you, don't really know what it is. Nobody knows gap. what it is. People say it's a elaborate computer uh, set of computer uh, connections. I don't believe it. So um, I'm intrigued by the title of your book, um, Fields of Color. Yeah. Why that title? Okay, well, <clears throat> um, the theory that I learned uh, in Harvard, was, it's called quantum field theory, but there are different views of it. There was uh, a battle, you might call it that, of the, in the uh, late 40s between Richard Feynman and Julian Schwinger. Feynman had his version of quantum field theory that was based on particles. Schwing, in Schwinger's view, the world is made of fields, and only fields. But a field is something very hard to picture. People, you can picture an electron, a little baseball, so to speak, whirling around. A field is very hard to picture. The field, idea of fields was introduced into physics in the 1800s by Michael Faraday, but people couldn't accept the idea that space could have properties. So I came up with the idea that if you pictured space having colors, if you represent each field by a color, the gravitational field will be a blue, blueness of space. So if you can picture the Earth with a kind of blueness of the space around it, then you have some idea of what the field is. So I introduced this idea of using a different color to picture each field, fields of color. I see, I love that it. Became I love title. it. And then your tagline is, um, the, what is the, uh, the theory that escaped Einstein? Yeah. So okay. what is the theory that escaped Einstein? Well, it's called quantum field theory, the theory that Schwinger perfected. It had been kicking around. I told you Richard Feynman had his version. But Schwinger formulated this all fields, only fields, no particles version. And uh, I say in my book how Einstein never trusted quantum field theory. He had had a tutorial, so to speak, from a friend of his uh, who tried to teach him quantum field theory, but he didn't like it. And I say in my book that this, he hadn't picked the right person at the right time to get the tutorial. And I say, I can't help but wonder what might have happened if Einstein had waited a bit longer for his tutorial and chosen a different tutor, perhaps Julian Schwinger. And I go on to describe this encounter that never took place, that could have changed the whole course of history. The year was 1954, the year published, Schwinger published his final installment of his papers. The 36-year-old Schwinger comes to Princeton to meet the 75-year-old Einstein, who is to die the next year. And he begins to explain his theory. Einstein, I tell, go on for several paragraphs. Einstein is captivated, answers questions. Schwinger answers them. I say Einstein gives in. He recognizes that quantum field theory meets his desire for a field theory because Einstein loves looking for a field theory, but he didn't. He never found it. Without putting together what God hath torn asunder, he appreciates the explanations of blah 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 blah. Uh, he announces to the world that this is a theory that, this, that he's been looking for, restoring the popular appreciation and understanding of science that once existed in the time of Newton and Maxwell. And then I say, but that didn't happen. And so the most wonderful theory ever devised, a theory that has produced more precise agreement, et cetera, et cetera, has remained, largely remained a secret. And that's why I wrote the book. I see. So you're saying had Einstein had someone like Swinger underneath him, that would have changed the course of my history. <laughs> it's all imaginary now. It didn't happen. But if he had, um, if Schwinger had, if he had gone to Schwinger and said, "Tell me about this quantum field theory that sure. you've been working on," 
So why hasn't science picked up on, on that theory? Why? I mean, why, why is everyone so against it? Well, that's a, that's a key question. <clears throat> I describe three battles in my book. I say the first battle, uh, because um, for one, the main reason perhaps is Feynman's theory involving particles was much easier to work with. Also, Feynman was a much better communicator. Schwinger was very dense. Uh, that's not quite the right way. It was very difficult to understand. I sat through three years of his lectures, taking notes, going back and studying the notes, trying to fi figure out what Schwinger had said, what he meant. He didn't communicate very well. He wrote these six papers, the theory of quantized I, I will guarantee you there isn't a physicist today who has read those papers. I know one physicist friend who said he picked one up and tried to read it, and he couldn't. So th those are some of the reasons why. I see. So it sounds like they're just incomprehensible. <laughs> they were Pretty at much. such a high level. Okay. Can you say uh, in, in one sentence what your mission is? To tell, to explain pop, uh, to explain quantum field theory to the lay audience without using equations, because you don't need equations to grasp the concepts of it, and show them how it makes sense and how it resolves the paradoxes of relativity and quantum mechanics and explains so many experiments that baffle people even today. So again, this so so you started this back at Harvard, is that? Oh, I, have that a, I learned it. I learned, learned it there okay. in, Harvey, in Harvard. When I retired, we moved to New Zealand in the year 2000. Uh, I, t I told you I started to write the book on consciousness, but I gave it up. I see. <clears throat> but as I looked into quantum mechanics, I began to realize how confused everybody, that, that nobody had ever latched on to this quantum field theory. And the world, uh, you know, I have quotes in my book. Uh, Bill Clinton says, before I die, I want to finally understand quantum mechanics. Uh, Marilyn Vaux Savant, the most smartest person in the world, supposedly, said, don't try to understand the theory of relativity. Nobody can understand it. All we can do is parrot the things that... Now, confusion was all over the place because relativity doesn't make sense without quantum field theory, unless you understand that things are made of fields. Quantum mechanics doesn't make sense as a theory of particles, but if you recognize that these so-called particles are really pieces of field, then it makes sense. So it's just, it, it amazing, amazes me that this is perhaps one of the biggest missing links of today. Yes. So it occurs to me as we're sitting here talking about this right now that <laughs> There's a big missing link in science, and that's this quantum field theory. Agreed? Yes, yeah. Well, it's not com completely buried. Uh, there are a few people, and I mentioned some of them, Sean Carroll, uh, Frank Wilczek. Uh, there are a few physicists who are trying to tell people that fields is the answer. But when I just had a survey done because of an article that I'm writing, of <clears throat> articles about certain experiments that are confusing to people. And I asked my assistant to go over 200 websites, uh, 200 articles on the web, the leading 200 articles about these experiments, to see if the possible, even if quantum field theory was even suggested in them as a possible solution. Only something like four out of 200 articles even mentioned. The, every other one was talking about particles and how confusing everything was, and what about this solution, what about that solution. So if a few people come along, me, these other people, and try to, you're up against the sea. And that's my question. Are people confused? Oh, man. Or are, are they just, are they flat out wrong? that they're not looking at this theory, not taking it into consideration mainstream. Why aren't the professors taking a look at this in a very strong way? Um, in the physics community, you'll find 
more people who are aware of quantum field theory. In the, but even there, they're very much outnumbered. Most physicists don't even know about it. Because they weren't taught. They weren't taught it. Because that's where it starts. If you're not learning it as you did with yes. the Schwinger, how can you know? But if you're taught it, you're taught the Feynman approach, right. which doesn't talk about fields. If Feynman called his own approach in his own words absurd. He said it doesn't make sense. You have to accept it. So physicists accept these confusions, these paradoxes. They acclimate themselves to saying, well, that's the way the world is. You've heard of Schrodinger's cat. That's the ultimate. Uh, Schrodinger came up with this. I, he, was, he thought this was so crazy, these paradoxes. So he said, this leads to the picture of a cat being both half dead and half alive, a reductio ad absurdum of the idea of superposition of states. But that's what these other people ask you to believe. Now today, and this is the irony of it, Schrodinger's reductio ad absurdum, this is ridiculous, he called it, is taken as being real by many people, or something like it. So uh, even in the physics community, there are not too many people who are aware of quantum field theory, and those who are take the Feynman view. There are very few people in the physics community. And in the lay community, uh, you hardly hear a mention of it. I, I do a lot of blogging. There's a, on the internet, you know, there's various sites where they ask questions about physics, among other things, and people are so confused. You see all these questions, and once again, what's missing? The, the answer, quantum field sure. theory. So take your example of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, yeah. how is he aware of this? Just an intelligent guy that that's one... one. Well, I, I don't know. I ran across a quote someplace. I forget how I ran across mm -hmm. it, but he said, I mean, he look, he's an intelligent guy and he wanted to... And he, like many intelligent people who've looked into this, before I die, he said, I would like to understand quantum mechanics. I sent him a copy of my book. I said, here's the answer, Bill. But I, of course, I know, knew it wouldn't get through to him, and I never heard anything, of course. But if Bill Clinton read this book, he would say, now I understand quantum mechanics because it's not particles, it's fields. I see. So we need to get President Bill Clinton a book. Would you do that we for me? We will do that. American Real will do that for you. Okay. So I guess in layman terms, we could we could move on to another topic. By the way, let me just tell you. Sure. I also sent a letter to Marilyn Vos Savant recently, about a week ago. She had a puzzle in her column, and she invited people to respond, and she would publish the best answer. So I sent her my answer, and I said, by the way, Marilyn, you're quoted in my book here as not understanding relativity. Please read my book. That's great. And sh is she considered uh, the highest IQ in, in the world? Well, that's her reputation, Marilyn. according yes. to the Guinness Book of World Records. Right, right, right. You no, know, she right. has a column in Parade magazine. Yes, yep. No, she's... So, mm -hmm. again, in, in layman terms, um, how would you describe quantum field theory? The world is made of fields. The concept of the field is not an easy one. There are no little particles running around. The electron is a yellow, I'm using my color analogy, sure. it's not really yellow, but sure. you can picture it as being a kind of yellowness of space. Not a particle, but a smeared out yellowness. Everything is a field. The gravitational field is a blueness of space. Protons are red, redness of space. A field is a property of space that interacts with other fields. And it took, look, it took me, when I first ran across fields in the classical sense, that means the electromagnetic field that Maxwell developed uh, 150 years ago, or 100 years ago. Um, I had a tough time grasping this concept of, a, and other physicists did too, they invented an imaginary substance called ether because nobody could really picture uh, space with properties. But you can do it, Far Faraday did it, Maxwell did it, and after a year of studying electricity and magnetism, I became comfortable with the concept. I think my use of color is a big help in this. I think people who read my book and use this uh, crotch of color as being representing different fields. Uh, I think that makes that helps a lot. But it's not an easy concept. But in one sentence, a field is a property of space. 
it's it's fascinating. Obviously, I, I you know I have such a low understanding of this, so I'm trying to grasp what you're saying. But I guess for me, what I'm hearing you say is that quantum field theory is not the particle theory. Is that right? Sure. That's okay. It. Okay. Yeah. I see. There are no particles. I told you there are other people uh, trying to tell the world, trying to tell physics this. One of them is my friend Art Hobson. He published an article called "There Are No Particles; There Are Only Fields." It was published, but you know, one article, even in the Physical Review, I think it was published, it doesn't make much of a dent. Mm -hmm. So did you ever go into much re research with quantum field theory? Oh, no, no. I, as you know, as I told you, I did my research in medical imaging. Right, I helped right, right. improve PET scanners and MRIs. I see, I see. Um, mm. and, and you mentioned earlier New Zealand. You spent some time in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. You lived there. Uh, it, is that when you had the idea to, to begin writing this book? It was just around then, yes. I, I, the idea to write a book on consciousness came up before I retired. Okay. And I think I was, but I was working at the time, so this was just a part-time activity. But we went to New Zealand, uh, it was, by the way, the story of New Zealand, uh, it happened in uh, 2000, and everybody can remember the millennium. Sure. It was a big thing, and I wanted to do something special to make it memorable. So I looked at the map, I said, if we cross the international date line, we can celebrate it twice, and I'll never forget that. So we did a trip to New Zealand in December. We uh, loved the country. We had a, a New Year's Eve dinner and festival and walked to New Zealand on December 31st. We got on the plane on January 1st. We landed in Honolulu, Hawaii on December 31st and did it all over again. And this is you and your lovely wife, Karen. My, my lovely wife, Karen. Okay. Now, my smart wife, Karen. Yes. Uh, and uh, we love New Zealand so much that uh, I retired very shortly after that. And we said, Karen said, well, maybe we should have a split retirement move out of Washington. I said, well, what about New Zealand? <laughs> so we wound up actually moving to New Zealand. We lived in New Zealand for eight years until we began to have grandkids. And I see. What part there. of the country? What was the name of the city? Well, it was in the South Island of New Zealand, a city called Wanaka, a lovely Wanaka. little village, a town of 8,000 people. We fell in love with it. Is that wine country by chance? Oh, there's a lot. Yes, yes. A lot of wine country around there. We still buy New Zealand wines when we can. So, uh, can you can you give an example of how quantum field theory uh, uh, resolves the uh, paradoxes? Well, uh, I don't think I can go into any kind of detail, but I can give you an example of special relativity, the ones that Marilyn Vosavant was talking about. According to special relativity, as developed by Einstein, there are very strange things that happen. Uh, time moves more slowly if you're moving. Distances contract if you're moving. Einstein all der derived all of these results from his principle of relativity, which he postulated, and I call this a top-down method, but nobody can really understand. It doesn't make sense why these things happen. Why? How can you picture time slowing down just because you're moving? There's this famous twin paradox about two twins, and one of them gets in a rocket ship and scoots away and travels very, very fast, almost the speed of light, goes to some distant star, comes back, and his twin on Earth has gotten very old and has a beard, and he's just two days older. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. If you understand fields, and no, I can't go into the detail of how, but if you understand how fields work and interact and evolve, it all makes sense. All those are the dilation of time, the contraction of space. People wonder, why can't you go faster? Okay, this one maybe I could explain. Why can't you go faster than light? That comes up in these blogs all the time. Why can't we go faster? I, well, I won't take the time to read it from the book. Why can't you just push something harder? Because when you look at, if you think of fields as something that the properties of space, that, like wh wh why can't a wave in water go faster if you push on it? You, it can't because of the properties of water. 
Fields obey field equations that describe how they propagate. There's a constant in those equations that determines the speed. It can't go faster because it's a property of that field any more than a water wave can go. That's like an example. Other than that, you say, why can't it go faster? If it's a field, it makes sense. Incredible. It's pretty deep. I'll tell you that. It's, it's not too uh, easy to comprehend. Uh, so I'm going to have to do a little bit more homework <laughs> on quantum you didn't field theory. That, huh? <laughs> so when um, when we were outside earlier doing the the drone shot, uh, I couldn't help but think about what you're thinking as far as the physics involved with something like that. I mean, what when when you see something like a drone and it has a camera and, and all the technology that's related to that. Uh, does that perplex you, or are you? Is it, does it perplex you as much as it does me? Well, I know what you mean. Um, I guess there's two completely different types of complexities or perplexities. That were one of them is technology. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, the technology in the drone is not that different from what I grew up with. It's just been refined quite a bit. Uh, but the technology today is so awesome. Uh, people, they do things, and you know, I saw, I, I saw, uh, let me tell you a quick little story. I was working for Sylvania very early on. I think I was still a student at the time, summer job. and. Uh, they had this idea, wouldn't it be great if we could have a flat screen television? So they assigned a group of engineers to look into how to do a flat, flat screen television. They concluded it was impossible. <laughs> now we have three or four different sure. ways of doing it, and that's just the beginning. So the, the technology that we have, uh, what can be done, has just gone crazy. And, very, I certainly don't understand it. But the other question, the, the, this quantum field theory, the relativity, quantum mechanics, this is what underlies everything. Forget technology. When you get down to the level of the atom, what does the atom look like? Is it little particles? Uh, and how do things behave when they're going fast? These are more basic questions, and that's where the confusion, that's a different kind of confusion from the technological awesomeness. Does an atom contain space within it? Well, an atom is made up, uh, it doesn't exactly contain space, but I, w I won't take the time to show you pictures, but one picture, what does the atom look like? By the way, I gave a talk not too long ago in a Prague in the Czech Republic, one of my favorite countries, by the way, and um, I put up a picture of the atom as it used to be looked at, as it usually is looked at. It's called the Rutherford model with electrons in orbit. Sure, as we learned in school. As, you, every, as everybody learns yes. in school, yeah. And the other part of the screen, I put up a picture of uh, the field, pic, uh, quantum field picture theory, where you see this yellowness of space around the red blob of a nucleus. And I said, which picture is the right picture of the atom. Nobody knew which to pick. Uh, I, I think some people voted for one, a few voted for the other. Most people didn't know. There's confusion. Uh, so it's at that level, you know, just, if just what does the atom look like? That, that's the most fundamental question you can ask. And there's two very different answers. If it's a, a particle picture, it leads you into paradox. If you have a field picture, it resolves, it, it makes sense, resolves the paradox. Do you feel it will be resolved? Uh, and how, if so, how long will it take? I, I kind of think it's a lose. I don't know, I'd like to be optimistic, but you know, when the truth, when lies get a head start, it's very hard for the truth to catch up. and. We've got at least 50 years of momentum, if not 100 years. It all started, let me tell you quickly, the first battle took place in 1905. Uh, Einstein 
uh, was the big player in the battle. Later on he had his doubts, but 1905 Einstein wrote a paper, one of his, in fact it was a paper that he got the Nobel Prize for, <laughs> because he never did get the Nobel Prize for relativity, because relativity was too controversial. But he wrote a paper on the photoelectric effect, photoelectric effect where he said the, the electromagnetic field acts like a particle, that it's absorbed like a particle. Now, the quantum field theory answer to that, at least in my opinion, is that the spread out field of the photon collapses into an absorbing atom. Uh, even that, by the way, that's, even in, that is controversial, even among the quantum field theory people. But the, um, that's the picture that uh, came out. And you pretty much, people bought, so what, what was a photon? Was it a particle or a field? And Einstein said, well, it seems to be a particle, and there was reason to think so, and people kind of bought into that. However, Einstein, when he died, or before he died, excuse me, about a year before he died, he said, after all these 30 years of pondering, I still don't know what a photon is. If Schwinger had met sure. Einstein, and they could have resolved that. Him. Sure, sure. So let me ask you, the. Uh, your book's been out for a few years now. Uh, is it is it building any momentum, or is it successful in your mind? Yes and no. It's, it's very success. more successful than I thought it would have been, in the sense that I've sold almost eleven thousand copies at this point, counting the e-books and the print books. It's in the third edition where I've improved it. <clears throat> it has a very high rating on Amazon. It's got over two hundred. 200 reviews on Amazon with almost a four and a half star average, which is phenomenal. But so 10,000, 11,000 people, mostly non, almost all non-physicists, have read the book and almost all of them understand and love it. What, what difference does 10 or 11,000 people make? I'm happy with that level of success, but I don't think it, you know, it, it, it's a drop in the sand. It's sure, but I guess the point is that uh, people are, are buying it, people are reading it, people are reviewing it, giving it good reviews. So there's, there's some momentum here for this view. Well, uh, I wouldn't exactly call it momentum, even if 100,000 people buy it. You know, the, as long as the physics community it's teaching the way it is, mm -hmm. and people in high school are learning the Rutherford sure. model of the atom. You know, it's only going to break. It's going to take a, almost a miracle to, mm -hmm. to change a hundred years of conditioning. So I'm not going to bet on it. So is this the end of it? Well, I'm 85 years old, and uh, uh, I have one last hope. I'm working on an article, trying to. Uh, publish it in the physics literature, not for the layman, but in the physics literature, to show physicists how quantum field theory explains the measurement problem, which has been called the most controversial problem in physics today, uh, other, the delayed choice experiment, other uh, currently problematic experiments, and if I can get that published. But even then, it'll be one little, like Art Hobson's article, one little article among right. many. It's uh, I'm not optimistic, okay. and I hate I hate it. Bothers me. It's terribly disturbing to think that this mm -hmm. can't be rectified. But I don't think it can. So, doing some research, what is the quantum collapse? Well, that's a very key thing, and this is a, one of the thing that keeps one of the things that keeps physicists from really buying into Schwinger's version of quantum field theory. Uh, but it, you know, I'm so, it, it has to be. Um, if a, going back to a photon, a photon is a little piece of light, and it's pretty well established. Everybody accepts that light comes out in little pieces. That light bulb, bulb up there is throwing out little, not just a continuous wave, but you can actually come out with the light sources that send out one chunk and then another one, one by one. You can only see them one by one. They're called photons. Um, when that chunk of light, it's seen as a particle, 
oh, great, it travels through here, it's the eye and it's absorbed. But seen as a field, it's spread out, and when it hits the eye, it, or sun, any place, it has to be absorbed into that one little atom in the eye. That means the entire field has to disappear. I call that quantum collapse. Okay. That's what quantum collapse is. It's counterintuitive. It's one of the bullets. It's, quantum field theory explains so much, but one of the things that you have to bend a little on to accept is the idea that a field that's spread out can really act as a unit and suddenly deposit all its energy into one little atom. So is that quantum collapse part of your mission as far as... Yes, that's okay. an important part of explaining, especially to the physics community. The phys uh, physicists have more trouble accepting quantum collapse, and I think that's the, one of the big reasons, maybe the big reason, why this version of quantum field, well, there's many reasons, I told you, Schwinger is hard to understand, but that's one of the reasons, the difficulty in accepting quantum collapse. I see. Well, this has been fascinating. I have a, I have a couple of more uh, questions, uh, and we'll let you go. Um, my first is, uh, you know, quite off topic, but what is uh, something about you that not even your closest friends and family would know? I'm an open book, Roger. <laughs> nothing. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess uh, I, I'm, I'm talking At least more, nothing I would want to talk about. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> talking more about, um, you know, do, 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 you, do you think about things outside of science that uh, you're intrigued by? So say, you know, be it, um, you know, what happens to the body when we're, you know, when we're gone, you know, does the soul go somewhere? Is there, is there anything that, uh, you know, outside of your science career that, uh -huh. that you just have an interest in knowing about? Oh, yeah, I think about, uh, you can call them philosophical questions. I think about a lot of them, yeah, sure. I mean... Anything well, in particular? Well, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, I think about evolution. I, I'm always thinking about things. Um, I think about evolution, which is clearly established, but there are strange things that happened uh, that nobody that seemed very hard to explain by evolution. Makes me wonder. Uh, I wish we had explanations for them, uh, such as what? Can you give us an example? Oh, ch uh, childbirth. Uh, how can you picture a series of? I just saw a, a video of. Let me get it right now. Not kangaroos, giraffes. Of giraffes, of a giraffe giving birth. April the giraffe. Yes, April the giraffe. Uh, uh, sexual reproduction. I, uh, sec I, I began to wonder about second teeth. What series of gradual increments can explain how second teeth? But anyway, there, there's lots of mysteries around us. Lots, lots of I, things I worry about. The national debt. You know, I think we're doing a terrible, I think this country has put itself into a critical, I don't know how we can work our way out of this. This, yeah, I think about a lot of things, you know. So if you were in charge today and President Trump hired Dr. Brooks yeah. to give him an idea on how to fix the debt, what would you, what would you propose? Well, it's probably too late. I don't know, you know, I'm not an economist, but I tell people, that after World War II, we had a huge debt, and we had saved the world. People of today, I don't think, appreciate the magnitude of the sacrifice that that generation made. I don't think they appreciate how big the stakes were. The wars that we fight today in foreign lands were, uh, you know, the stakes, the stakes then were huge, and we piled up this huge debt, and after the war was over, they could have said, well, we've sacrificed a lot. Let's let our, let our next generation, we've saved it for the world for the next generation, let's right. pass it on. But they put into effect a tax code with the highest marginal rate of 91% that lasted through Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy until they took a different, and they decreased the debt. What can you do? You can. 
raise taxes. But you can't raise taxes today because right. people say, don't touch my money. Because we've gone from being the generation that sacrificed to the, gen to the me generation. That what, can, what does it mean to me? Don't cut my tax. I won't, don't touch my money. No. So maybe uh, in there there's some compromise. Well, I don't know about compromise. Ideally, you don't compromise. You do your damnedest, as they did, to pay off the debt and to start now. Fascinating. 91%. Yeah. But, you know, I generally believe... Uh, in fact, it was, I just read this book. We were at a restaurant, you and I. Uh, and they had a, a quotation on the menu from, of all people, Václav Havel, one of my idols, a Czech uh, poet and politician, and basically it said, hope is not to ask if it's possible to do, hope is to do what is the right thing to do. You do the right thing, and you, you know, this, the right thing, both morally and practically, is to pay down this debt. So it's not going to happen any more than it's likely the quantum field theory will be accepted. Sure. May, may I see your book? I was hoping you would ask. Yes. So Fields of Color, The Theory That Escaped Einstein. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Uh, congratulations on this. We will, we will put this out there. Uh, before we let you go, one more question. Uh-oh. What would you like your legacy to be? after well, you leave this earth? Well, of course, uh, it's obvious the acceptance of quantum field theory. Sure. And if, I, if this book has had a little ha helping hand in that, great. Yeah. Sure. We, it would be a miracle. It would be wonderful. I'd like to think it would happen. Well, I think it will. Huh? From your lips, as my grandmother would say, to God's ears. Thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on American Real. I'm very glad to have been here, and I thank you for a wonderful interview, Roger. Thank you.